Welcome back to our learning course. In this lesson, we will look at a classic question that has kept animal psychologists busy for about a century, and we still cannot agree on an answer. The question is, when deciding what to do, do animals imagine what may happen next? When a dog brings you a ball, does it do it because it imagines going to play outside? Or does it do it just because it remembers vaguely that bringing the ball was followed by something good in the past? This is the kind of question where we can reasonably expect differences between animals. Intuitively, we don't think that a bee or a fly have the same understanding about the world as a dog, gorilla, or dolphin, or even a rat. But at this point, we don't really know what the differences are. So I will speak of what is known from laboratory experiments with mostly rats. In future lessons, we will consider these and similar questions for other species, like crows and chimpanzees. Psychologists ask the question, do animals imagine the future using experiments on Pavlovian and instrumental conditioning? For example, Pavlov could ask whether his dogs imagined the food when they got excited at the sound of the bell. And Skinner could ask whether his pigeons were thinking about the food when they were deciding whether to peck or not. Psychologists also frame the question in terms of what associations are formed during learning. Let's see how this works in Pavlovian conditioning first. For simplicity, let's consider a case where the unconditioned and conditioned response are the same, like in Pavlov's original experiment. In this case, we are considering three things, the CS, the US, and the response R, be it the CR or the UR. It is helpful to think of the classic example of bell, meat, and salivation as in Pavlov's experiment. The arrow indicates that in the mind of the dog, there is already a connection between the US and the response before the experiment starts. This is our explanation for why the sight and smell of the meat evoke salivation. Psychologists refer to these connections as associations. The question is how the CS gets associated with the response. One possibility is that the CS gets connected with the US as indicated by the red arrow. In this view, the response is elicited because the CS brings to mind, so to speak, the US. In other words, the dog would be thinking, I hear the bell and I learn that meat comes after the bell, so it's a good idea to salivate. Of course, we don't mean that the dog literally thinks like this, just that somehow the sound of the bell activates a representation of the meat through the association. And this in turn activates the salivation response. Representation is the psychologist's way of saying something like mental image or something that comes to mind. The representation of a stimulus is whatever happens in the brain when the dog perceives that stimulus. The other possibility is that the CS gets connected directly with the response, as shown by this red arrow. In this view, the dog would not think of meat when it hears the bell. It would just think that it's a good idea to salivate. He would think something like, I hear the bell, it's time to salivate. The dog would need the CS-US experiences to learn this connection, but after the connection is formed, there would be no memory of the US. So, in Pavlovian conditioning, the question of whether animals imagine what is going to happen translates into the question of what association is formed. Is that an association between two stimuli, the CS and the US, or between one stimulus, the CS, and the response? In instrumental conditioning, the situation is similar, but usually we think about different associations. Let's see this with the classic example of a rat that learns to press a lever when a light is on. We have, again, two stimuli, the light and the food, and one response, lever pressing. The food stimulus is labeled S+, plus to indicate that it is a positive reinforcer. The first possible connection that we will consider is between the light stimulus and the lever press response. In this view, the animal would connect in its mind the light and the lever press, without actually knowing that the reason for this connection is that the lever press in the presence of the light earns food. So the rat would think something like, oh, I see that light, it's a good time to press the lever. This is very similar to the connection between the conditioned stimulus and the conditioned response that we considered for Pavlovian condition. The other possibility that psychologists have considered is that instrumental conditioning creates a connection between the mental representations of the response and of the food. In this view, rats would form a mental image of the fact that pressing the lever leads to food. 
This is more similar to the stimulus-stimulus view of Pavlovian condition. So, in instrumental conditioning, the question of whether animals understand what's coming is phrased as an alternative between a stimulus-response association, which would mean no understanding, and a response-reward association, which would mean at least some understanding. Note that in instrumental conditioning does not make sense to consider a stimulus-stimulus association that is an association between the light and the food. The reason is that instrumental conditioning is about learning an action, and so whatever is learned must include information about the action that is performed. The terms stimulus-response and stimulus-stimulus association have been used since the dawn of experimental psychology. Nowadays, it is also popular to talk about habitual and goal-directed learning. An animal that behaves habitually would do things kind of mindlessly, just repeating the same actions over and over without reflection. This is close to the traditional stimulus-response learning, where the U.S. and the reward do not figure once learning has taken place. On the other hand, a goal-directed animal would have in mind what's going to happen to pursue its own goals. So Pavlov's dog would salivate because it knows that food is coming, and Skinner's rat would press the lever because it knows that doing so earns food. Of course, as I said earlier, we don't think that this knowledge is expressed in a form like human language, but rather that it is encoded in associations between mental representations of these events. We will see shortly an additional reason why the terms habitual and goal-directed make sense. Let's now see how we can tell what kind of associations are established in Pavlovian instrumental conditioning. The key empirical tool for this investigation has been a kind of experiment known as the revaluation experiment. I will explain this experiment using food as the reward and the toxin that makes the animal sick as a punishment. Other possibilities exist, and we will see other examples in the coming slides. The basic design is as follows. It's pretty much the same for Pavlovian and instrumental conditioning. In a first phase, called the acquisition phase, we show the animal that something leads to food. This something is indicated with X in the table, because it can be different in Pavlovian and instrumental conditioning. In Pavlovian conditioning, this is a stimulus, the CS, like the usual sound or light. In instrumental conditioning, this is an action, like pressing a lever or a button. In the second phase, we establish the dislike for the food that was earned during the first phase. This is typically done with a drug that gives the animal a bellyache. This is called the taste aversion learning, and you can see the lessons on Pavlovian preparations and on animals as naive detectives for more details. This second phase is called the revaluation phase because its goal is to change the value of the food in the eyes of the animal, turning it from yummy to yucky. It is important that in this phase the Pavlovian stimulus or the instrumental actions are not present. There is no bell in case of Pavlov's dog and no lever to press for Skinner's rat. What we are testing is whether the animal can understand that the Pavlovian stimulus or the instrumental action now leads to something bad rather than something good. Let's look now at the final test of the experiment and its possible results. In the third phase of the experiment, the Pavlovian stimulus is presented again, or the instrumental action is allowed again. For example, Pavlov would sound the bell and Skinner would put the rat back in the Skinner box with the lever. The goal of this test is just to see what the animal does. Sometimes the animal responds exactly how it did before the revaluation phase. This result supports the stimulus response views of Pavlovian and instrumental conditioning, according to which the animal is not thinking about what's coming next. So the dog would salivate and the rat would press the lever, but then they would not eat the food because now they find it yucky. This is why stimulus response learning is also called habitual. The animal would respond out of habit, simply because the response worked in the past, without thinking about whether the response is appropriate now. It's like when one takes a wrong turn by mistake to follow a habitual route, like going to school, instead of the actual route you need to follow that day, like going to the dentist. Another possible result is that the animal responds less during the extinction test than during acquisition, this is the answer predicted by the alternative views of conditioning. In the case of Pavlovian conditioning, seeing the CS would make the dog think of the yucky food, meaning that he should not salivate. Likewise, in instrumental conditioning, the rat would think that pressing the lever is going to produce yucky food, and so he should not press. 
This is how the revaluation experiment can distinguish between the different views of conditioning, and so informs us about what animals are thinking. Unfortunately, the results are sometimes ambiguous. For example, a dog might salivate less during the test, but still salivate some. Does this mean it was thinking about the food or not? We get back to this after seeing a few examples. Personally, I cannot think of an experiment that I have seen where animals stop responding completely right away after the revaluation phase, which would be the strongest kind of evidence for animals knowing what is coming. Before moving on, note that the third phase of the revaluation experiment is called the extinction phase because the stimulus or action happens without being followed by the food. This is important because we are testing whether the animal can imagine, so to speak, that the food is supposed to be coming. If we actually present the food, we remind the animal of its changed value and the test becomes ambiguous. Let's now look at an experiment by Adams that used two groups of rats. The group called paired followed exactly the basic revaluation design just explained. Rats were first trained to press a lever for food. After this, the revaluation treatment consisted of feeding them the food and giving them a bellyache with a drug. Then they were tested to see how much they would press the lever. The unpaired group received similar training, but with a crucial difference. The rats in this group were given a bellyache not after they consumed the food, but at another time. This difference means that the paired group would develop an aversion to the food, but the unpaired group would not. So only the paired group should have stopped pressing the lever. The reason why Adams used the unpaired group was to control for the possibility that the drug itself, by making the rats sick, could make them less willing to press the lever or do anything else. You can imagine that if you have just had a bellyache, you might want to do less of everything, not just what made you sick. So what Adams was after was a comparison between the paired and unpaired groups. Both groups had been sick, but the paired group only should press less if rats can learn about the outcomes of their own actions. But this is not what happened, as we see in this graph. The paired and unpaired groups press the lever exactly the same number of times. Having been sick after eating the food seemed to have no effect on the rat's willingness to press the lever. In other words, the rat happily performed an action that would give them something that they did not want. The food was not present in the extinction test, but Adams checked afterwards that the pair group had in fact developed the food aversion, while the unpaired group had not. The baseline point at the left of the graph represents the level of lever pressing at the end of the acquisition phase, before the rats were made sick. We can see that this is higher than the beginning of the extinction test, even in the unpaired group. This means that this control group really was helpful. If Adams had not included it, we could have been tricked into thinking that the paired group's drop in lever pressing was because they decided not to press for something they did not want. But having the unpaired group shows that the drop was really just because the rat had been sick. In summary, in this experiment, the rats did not demonstrate any knowledge of the outcome of their own action, which agrees with the stimulus response view of instrumental condition. Now we look at an experiment by Rescorla. This was a fear conditioning experiment. You can look at the lesson on Pavlovian preparations for the basics of fear conditioning and at the lesson on blocking and over expectation for some more details of how fear is measured. The experiment had two groups of rats called C0 and CH. All rats learned to be afraid of a light that was followed by a very loud noise. As we can see in this graph, this worked as expected. And when the light was on, all rats showed to be afraid of it. This was measured as usual in fear conditioning studies by looking at how much the rats stopped lever pressing for food. You can go back to the lessons on blocking and over expectation for details on this measure. Or you can just keep in mind that a higher value means more fear. The two groups differed in what happened next. For group C0, nothing happened. Rats in group CH, on the other hand, were habituated, that is what the H stands for, to the loud noise. They heard the noise over and over again and learned that it had no bad consequences. At this point, Rescora turned on the light that had been associated with the noise. His reasoning was that a stimulus response rat would continue to be afraid of the light because it would have learned a direct connection between the light and fear. On the other hand, a stimulus-stimulus rat would remember the noise when seeing the light 
and think something like, the light means that the loud noise is coming, but I'm not afraid of that noise anymore, so I can keep eating. Now comes the interesting part. In some textbooks, the results of the experiment are presented like this. Here we see that the habituated rat showed less fear of the light compared to the non-habituated rat. The effect is not large, but is there. This suggests that the habituated rats could realize at least a little bit that they should not be afraid of the light anymore, as they had stopped being afraid of the noise. But the result shown here is the average over 12 presentations of the light. If we look at all the presentations, we realize that there was initially no difference between the two groups of rats. All showed to be very afraid of the light. The difference developed across successive experiences with the light. It is not clear what is happening here. If the rats were using simple stimulus response learning, there should be no difference between the two groups. If they used sophisticated similar stimulus learning, they should have realized immediately that after habituation to the noise, the light was nothing to be afraid of. Instead, the rats did something in between. They started out afraid of the light, but they lost this fear gradually. As I mentioned earlier, there are some things about revaluation experiments that psychologists do not yet understand fully. Let's now talk about another taste aversion learning study by Chen and Amsel. The design is very similar to the Adams study we saw earlier, but in this case, the revaluation treatment was effective in changing the rat's behavior. There were four groups of rats in this experiment, but we can get the point across by considering three. All of them were first made thirsty and allowed to run an alley to find water that had been flavored with a bit of vinegar. This is indicated as VIN in the design table of the experiment. We can see in the top graph that within a few trials, all rats learned to run the alley to get the water as quickly as possible, with a final speed of 60 centimeters per second, or about 25 inches per second. At this point, the three groups received different treatments. One group was made ill after drinking the vinegar water. One group was made ill after drinking sweet water without any vinegar flavor and the third group simply drank some more vinegar water. All this happened in the rats' home cages, not in the running alley. The next day, the rats were placed in the running alley, and their running speed was measured over five successive trials. There was nothing at the end of the alley, so the rats were running just based on what they thought they would find. As in the experiments we saw before, the idea is that the rats who got sick after drinking the vinegar water should not be interested in running to the end of the alley if they can imagine that the action of running leads to where the water used to be. This seems to have worked at least partly in this experiment, as these rats ran at about half the speed of the other groups. They were the most reluctant to go to the end of the alley, although eventually they also checked it out. As in the previous experiment, the other groups have the purpose of making our conclusions sound. Comparison with the vinegar-only group tells us that just drinking some more vinegar water does not decrease running speed much. This is the green line in the graph. Comparison with the sweet water group tells us that just getting sick from drinking something is not enough to make the rats slow down in the alley. It must be the flavor that they had previously found in the alley. I want to point out that the slowdown was seen in the very first trial. This is different and more convincing than what happened in Rescorla's experiment, where the difference between treatments and control groups developed during the test, but was not there on the first trials. Let us summarize what we have seen. We have seen that the revaluation experiment is how psychologists ask the question of whether animals imagine what's going to happen, be it a stimulus that happens beyond their control, as in Pavlovian conditioning, or the outcome of their own actions, as in instrumental conditioning. We have also seen that the evaluation experiment can give different results. Sometimes animals seem to know what happens, sometimes they don't, and sometimes the effect is small or ambiguous. As scientists, we are still not sure why different experiments give different results, even when they seem similar. There are some hypotheses, but at the time of the recording, they are not part of this course. This lesson is over. Here are some suggestions of what to study next. They all deal with how sophisticated is animals' ability to learn about their environment. Happy learning to everyone.